thank you so much for having me here. I'm really excited to be here and to tell you um, a little bit about my story. Um, as um, most of you know, um, I haven't always been the chemistry teacher here at Summit Prep. Um, there might be a few freshmen that didn't realize I haven't been here for forever. Um, and before I um, took my position teaching here, um, I had a career um, as a medicinal chemistry researcher. Um, and I want to tell you about what I learned on my journey um, through research and into teaching um, and how um, that journey has helped me realize that having purpose with passion is a key to achieving success and happiness. Um, so the word purpose, I think, comes up a lot um, when we talk about motivation and success and happiness. Um, and often it's used in a cliche way. Um, like if you've seen Avenue Q, it's a Broadway musical. There's a whole song and dance number with a, uh, like a Muppet um, singing about finding purpose after he graduates from college. Um, but it also is used in, in some more serious um, research um, when looking at motivation. Um, so for example, um, Daniel Pink, the author of the book Drive, defines um, purpose as the yearning to do um, what we do in the service of something larger than ourselves. And he considers purpose one of three key elements for achieving intrinsic motivation. Um, now, when I was working in medicinal chemistry research, um, I had abundant purpose. Um, and so I do want to tell you about what that research was so that you can really understand what I mean when I say um, that I had that purpose. Um, and so I'm going to focus on the research that I did when I was in the Department of Chemistry at Stanford, working um, with Paul Wender and many collaborators in the Wender Research Group. Um, so um, I think we're all familiar with HIV, um, the virus that causes AIDS. Um, it is a devastating disease um, that is, um, affects people worldwide. Um, over 34 million people are estimated to be infected as of 2010, um, and roughly two-thirds of the people who are infected are in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, what is um, really disturbing to me about this number isn't just that 34 million people is such a high number to be suffering from this disease, um, but that it is a number that continues to grow. Um, as you can see from, uh, from these figures, um, it was estimated that 2.7 million people became infected um, in 2010, um, and also 1.8 million people succumbed to, to the illness. Um, now, there is some hope and optimism in these numbers. Um, the 2.7 million new infections is down from its peak of over 3 million in one year. Um, and even more hopeful is that 1.8 million number is down dramatically from its peak. Um, and the reason why um, the numbers continue to grow is because we have developed some really effective treatment options that enable people who are infected to live um, longer and longer. In the developed world, um, HIV is now considered a manageable illness, not a deadly disease. Um, and the reason is because we've developed a huge variety of very effective treatments for the disease. Um, these treatments increase life expectancy. Again, that is why the number of people who are infected on this planet continues to rise, because the people who are infected continue to live. Um, and that is a, a huge and wonderful development. Um, and the current therapies are customizable. They're combinations of drugs. Uh, there's over 33 to choose from. And they can range from um, something as simple as taking one pill once a day um, to taking multiple pills multiple times a day um, to patient-administered injections. In the developed world, um, especially where um, there are the resources for the top of the line treatments, um, a patient on the right combination of drugs um, can have um, such effective treatment that there is no detectable virus in their, in their bloodstream. And this is phenomenal um, because it's when the virus is active in the patient's bloodstream that it causes damage and causes the disease to progress. So if you can stop the virus from reproducing and replicating um, so that it's no longer active in the bloodstream, you can um, dramatically slow down the progression of the disease. Um, unfortunately, um, 
early optimism that these treatments might um, eradicate the virus completely have not borne out. These drugs are not a cure. And the reason why they're not a cure is because HIV is a very clever little virus. Um, HIV is prone to, um, to mutation, um, which means that if it can replicate, um, it can become resistant to the drugs that are used to stop it from replicating. Um, and so a patient who is on these effective therapies, if they stop taking the drugs, even for a brief period, for example, if they go on a weekend trip and forget to take their medicine with them, they can return from that weekend um, and have had the virus start replicating again, mutate, and become resistant to those drugs. Um, so we really need to think about uh, ways that we can overcome this challenge. So the reason why the virus, even when we stop it from replicating, is able to come back is because of another thing that makes it very clever. Um, these, uh, HIV affects the very cells in our bodies that are designed to provide us with immunity to other diseases. Um, so the way that the immune system works is that it learns how to recognize invaders and attack and destroy them before we can feel sick. Um, so, for example, I had chicken pox when I was four years old, um, and it was a pretty miserable experience. I didn't really like having the chicken pox. Um, and I never, ever want to experience that again. So I have some cells in my body, um, like represented by these ones here, hibernating immune cells, that are specific to recognizing chicken pox. And if chicken pox ever comes along, they'll spring into action and get rid of it before I <coughs> can feel sick, um, as represented by these active immune cells. Um, and not only um, do I not want to experience chicken pox now, I don't want to get it again when I'm 94 either. Um, and the way that these cells that recognize chicken pox can survive so long um, is that they are in hibernation. So when they're hibernating, they can live longer. Um, and so that's really great for me as someone who doesn't want to get chicken pox again. My chicken pox fighting cells will be ready anytime I'm exposed to chicken pox again. Um, but these are the very same cells that HIV infects. So now you have these very long um, lived cells um, that can be infected by an HIV provirus. So that's HIV hiding in the nucleus of the cell. Um, and if these cells, these hibernating HIV-infected cells, spring into action, they start replicating the virus. So a patient who previously had no detectable virus in their bloodstream suddenly has virus spring up again if those drugs that were keeping the virus at bay before are no longer present. Um, so that is the challenge. That is why HIV is able to persist and hide out for so long in a patient's body despite these dramatic and very effective treatments. Um, so the, then what that gets us thinking about is, well, how do we get rid of these cells? And there's a big challenge there. Um, and it's that these HIV-infected cells, they look exactly the same as the ones that aren't infected. The other hibernating cells, their neighbors that are just hanging out waiting for chickenpox to come along. Um, and the only way that we can tell the difference is when they, bec they become activated and start replicating the virus. Because the virus is kind of like a flag. Hey, here I am, I'm infected, look at me. Um, and so if the cells become um, active, then we can say, okay, those are infected um, cells, and then we can kill them. So this is where the big idea behind my research comes in. We thought, well, maybe if you can make those cells produce HIV virus, make it clear that those are the infected cells, then we can identify them and kill them. Um, and while that seems kind of counterintuitive, why would you make the cells produce the virus that's so destructive to its host? Um, if we can do it while also giving people these current really effective treatments that stop the virus from producing more, um, then maybe with that double whammy combination, we can completely eradicate the virus. So now the big question is, how are we going to do that? This is where a really fascinating field called ethnobotany comes in. Um, ethnobotany is um, the study of plants that are used um, in different cultures around the world um, for different purposes. 
Um, so there was an ethnobotanist named Paul Cox who uh, worked with the native healers in Samoa um, to learn about the traditional medicines that they used in the treatment of a variety of different diseases. And he found that they have a plant called mamala, and the healers use the bark from the mamala tree to treat a variety of conditions, including hepatitis. So this got people really excited about mamala, and other researchers began to investigate and study <coughs> mamala and um, what makes it so effective. And they found that there's a molecule inside the plant called prostratin um, that is responsible for most of the biological activity. Um, and they also found, in the process of studying prostratin, that prostratin can force hibernating HIV to replicate. Uh, so at this time, prostratin is in preclinical trials. These are the rigorous scientific studies that need to take place in order to do human clinical trials. Um, and, and that is work that is being done um, by people in the field of medicine and biology. Now, I'm trained as a chemist, and so I look at prostratin, and I see a really fascinating molecule. But I also know that the mammal tree wasn't trying to treat human diseases when it made prostratin. The mammal tree most likely was trying to stop insects from feeding on it. Um, and so as a chemist with an expertise in um, synthesizing new molecules, I thought, I'm probably smarter than that tree. I think I can do something better. And that's exactly what I did. Um, I looked at the prostratin molecule, and I looked at how it behaves um, in cells, um, and I figured out the parts of the molecule that are critical for it to have <coughs> desired biological activity, and the parts where we might be able to make improvements. And so I focused my research then on designing those improvements, changing the molecule in a few key areas to try and get something even better than ProStrap. And through the course of my six years working on this project, I was able to design, um, make, and test molecules that were <coughs> over a thousand times more potent than ProStrap, that original molecule. Okay, so this is what I mean by purpose. Um, that doing something in the service of something bigger than myself. Um, I was doing something um, in the service of eradicating a deadly disease, um, which is huge. Um, and it was far beyond myself. This has the potential to impact 34 million people. Um, and yet, somehow, something felt missing to me when I was doing it. You know, I can talk about the research that I did and feel really proud of that work, um, but on a day-to-day -day basis, um, this didn't get me um, into lab with the same kind of excitement that I come to school here every day. Um, and I looked around at my colleagues in research, and some of them were working on projects that had much less obvious purpose than my own project, um, and they were jazzed. They were super excited. They were really into what they um, and I thought I was defective, because all of the pieces seem to be in place. I should be um, over the moon about what I'm doing on a daily basis, because this has such a clear purpose. And so I had to spend a lot of time um, really <coughs> reflecting on what was it that did get me excited. Um, and, it, and through that process, it became pretty clear what I needed to do. Because the part of being a graduate student that I loved the most was when I got to teach. Especially when I got to teach lab classes, because they were small, and I could get to know my students really well. Um, so that leads me here to Summit Prep. Um, as a high school teacher, I still have a very clear, very big purpose. Um, as every student in this room is familiar, our mission at Summit Prep is to prepare a diverse group of students for success in college, and to be thoughtful contributing members of society. That's huge. Um, and I believe passionately that in order to be a thoughtful contributing member of society and to be truly successful, you need to be able to think like a scientist. You need the same skills that I learned and honed for all of those years doing research. Um, those are critical skills for success. 
Um, so I can use the experience that I've had and leverage that to fulfill a greater purpose. Uh, but there's something more. I have passion for teaching. Um, I, have, I have passion for teaching because there's two key critical components in, in place. The first is that I really love chemistry. I really do. It's exciting. Um, it's really interesting. It's very fascinating stuff. Um, but the other thing is that every single day, I am working with and for people that I care about. And it's having that human connection um, that I need. Um, it's not just being able to collaborate with other people in the lab. It's being able to work for the people that I care about. Um, so um, Steve Jobs defines passion uh, as finding what you love um, and not settling until you found it. And I don't for a second ever think that I've settled um, now that I have found a career where I have purpose and I'm passionate. Um, and it's fun too. <laughs> so um, what I really with, want you guys to take away from this um, is that you can all find something that will be purposeful and that you will be passionate about. And I wish that for every single one of you. Um, but it's not easy. Um, everyone's passion is going to be different, which means, you know, just like I had coworkers who were actually super passionate about the molecules that they were making. Like I was really, pa I was really into like the idea of what I was doing, but the individual molecules themselves weren't like the most important thing in my life. Um, I had coworkers whose individual molecules, like that was their thing. Um, that was their passion, um, and they are thriving researchers um, today. Um, and so um, there isn't a formula for finding that passion. It is a long and winding journey. There are going to be detours, and it's going to be hard, um, but it is 100% worth it um, to find that perfect combination of purpose and passion.